and thank you all for taking the time to be here tonight. Uh, my name is Emilia Sara Olustotir Koper. And my name is Liam Fine, and we are the presidents of the Amherst Political Union. We would also like to thank the uh, Professor Monica Ringer and the Asian Languages and Civilizations Department, as well as the History Departments, for making this possible. Um, tonight, we welcome award winning journalist, feminist, and political activist Monal Dahawi. For over two decades, she has written for a variety of newspapers and magazines, including, among others, Foreign Policy, The Washington Post, The New York Times, and The Guardian. She has been the recipient of the Anna Lind Foundation Special Prize for Out Outstanding Contributions to Journalism, the University of Denver's ESFO International Center for Journalism and New Media's Anvil of Freedom Award, the European Union's Samir Kassir Prize for Freedom of the Press, and Search for Common Ground Eliav Sartawi's Award for Middle Eastern Journalism. Um, not only has our speaker tonight written extensively on the Middle East, but she has also been an active participant in the uh, conflicts which, which currently define the region, uh, particularly the Egyptian uprising of 2011, during which she was personally assaulted by riot police. And it was during, uh, it was while she was recovering from those injuries that she wrote the um, article for foreign policy entitled, Why Do They Hate Us? Which uh, she has now expanded on and will soon publish a book, which will be entitled, um, Bringing, uh, no, Headscarves and Hymens, Why the Middle East Needs a Sexual Revolution. And that, the topic of that article and that book is also what will be the subject of tonight's talk, Bringing the Revolution Home, Challenging the Patriarch in the Presidential Palace and in the Bedroom. And so, if you would all please uh, join me in welcoming our speaker, Ms. Mona Altahawi. Is, is this the mic working? Yes. Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. I'm very happy to be here at Amherst with you all. And I want to um, thank Mia, especially, for writing to me and inviting me to come and speak with you. Uh, before I begin my talk, I, I want to explain. I usually like to begin with an explanation of what my tattoos are. As Mia explained to you, I was assaulted in Egypt in November of 2011 during a five-day five protest between us, the revolution, and the Egyptian security forces, the military, as well as the police. Egyptian riot police broke both my arms and sexually assaulted me, and I was detained for 12 hours. And when my arms were in a cast, I made a promise to myself that when my bones healed, I would dye my hair red, and it's, I'm glad to be in the red room, so <laughs> I would dye my hair red because uh, red for me is a fierce color and uh, you can't miss it, and um, it's, a, it's also a color that says that I'm alive and I'm here, and um, you haven't killed me, basically. And also, I determined that, oh, I, I promised myself that I would get tattoos on both arms to celebrate both healing and to celebrate ma ma making a mark on my body of my own choosing. Because I needed surgery on this arm because the bone on this arm broke in such a way that it needed a titanium plate and screws. And I have a scar here that I'm very proud of, but I didn't create this scar. So I wanted to create marks on my body that, that I made as a way of taking my body back, as a way of, of uh, saying it's, you know, it's mine and I'm proud of everything that happened to me and this is how I'm marking it. So the first tattoo that I got here is of the ancient Egyptian goddess Sekhmet. And the way that she was described to me when she came to me, and I say she came to me because I'm sure I've seen her in various Egyptian temples. I've been on Nile cruises and you know I've been to the Egyptian museum, but she never really registered with me until I met her when I was on a speaking tour in Italy in 2012 and in a museum in Turin the museum director said that there are 19 statues of Sekhmet in this room. So at first I thought, wow, you've stolen half our treasures and I've got to take them home. And then I thought, okay, 19 statues of this woman, of this goddess rather, in this room and she has the head of a lion and my star sign is Leo, my sun sign is Leo. And the director said that Sekhmet is the, god, the goddess of retribution and sex. And I thought, wow, I want both of those. I want <laughs> retribution for what happened to me and sex as a way of moving beyond the pain and the sadness of sexual violence and sexual assault, which I will talk about later. And, and the way that I like to describe Sekhmet to encompass both of those things, retribution and sex, is I say that Sekhmet will kick your ass in and then fuck your brains out. 
So that's, that's what she basically encompasses. That kind of dichotomy, that kind of warrior healer, that, that paradigm that is often a very difficult one and that when you look at ancient times, more matriarchal cultures, cultures in which goddesses were worshipped, women were allowed to have those things. Women were allowed to be angry. Women were allowed to be warriors and healers at the same time. So I thought she was very appropriate for what I was trying to do at the time in, in the process of healing. And because I often end my talk with the second ink, but by the time I get to it, I forget, so I'm going to say it now. The, the second tattoo that I have is of the street, the name of the street where I was assaulted, which is now an icon of the Egyptian revolution. It's called Muhammad Mahmoud. And it's also the street where I used to go to university every day. I went to the American University in Cairo. So it was very surreal for me to be assaulted on the street that I would go to every day because of, of campus. The campus has now moved. But it's also the Arabic word for freedom, Horreya. Now, this tattoo was drawn for me by the American artist Molly Crabapple. And if you look into her work, she drew a lot of images from Occupy Wall Street. So she's kind of like the Occupy Wall Street artist. So it was really important for me that someone like her drew Sehmet for me because in a way Molly represents the start of an American revolution. And my tattoo of the Arabic calligraphy was drawn by an artist friend of mine who's a, an Egyptian artist. And his handle on Twitter, or his, his handle on Twitter is Pyroviski because it comes from pyromaniac because he was a master Molotov cocktail maker for the revolution. And he has a long history of activism and during that long history he was imprisoned for several months and had all his artwork destroyed by the Egyptian police. So I thought, you know, I've got an artist of the Egyptian revolution and an artist of a potential American revolution. So I'm very proud of this ink. And really these are the kind of the, the, the two kind of the bookmarks of my talk today. What Sehmet represents and what this other side, Muhammad Mahmoud and Hore represent. Because when I first began to watch the, the uprisings take kind of spark across the region, it was obvious that we were starting what, a, what is a political revolution. We were rising up against a regime that, that oppressed us all, men and women, everybody. And it was men and women together, shoulder by shoulder, side by side, in the streets fighting that regime. And in many instances, we were successful in removing some of those patriarchs from the presidential palace. Ben Ali from Tunisia, Mubarak in Egypt, Gaddafi in a very obviously deadly and fatal way in Libya and so on and so forth. But I, I'm much more interested in what happens when people go home. And what happens when those men and women who are marching side by side and who are fighting the police and the soldiers in Muhammad Mahmoud, what happens when they go home? And I mentioned earlier in the class that I spoke at for uh, women in the Middle East that the, uh, very, it's, it, one of the most influential periods for me, and I wish I lived in this time, was civil, the, during the Spanish Civil War, especially during these two years in Catalonia when the anarchists established basically the kind of society that I would love to have in, in everywhere, basically. And the anarchists, I, I draw a big distinction between the anarchists and the socialists, because they ended up fighting in the socialists won and then eventually lost to the fascists. But among the, the anarchists was a, a wonderful group of Spanish women called La Mujeres Libres. And for me, and I'm, 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 forgive me if you speak Spanish and I've just massacred the Spanish. But for me, that what they represent is a group of women who I very much identify with because they were in a society that was fighting against both religious, political, and social patriarchies of various kinds and reminding the men and asking the men what happens when we go home. And one of my favorite quotes um, from these free women of Spain is they say, you know, the compañeros, when we're outside, when we're marching, when we're in the factories, when we sit on the coffee shops, you know, they're our real comrades. But when we go home, they take off the revolution as if they're taking a costume or as if they're taking their shoes off, if you come from a culture where you take your shoes off outside the home. So what does it mean to take off the revolution like a costume? It either means that you're play acting at revolution or you don't take that revolution seriously or as Siraj mentioned earlier when I mentioned this quote, it means that you want to take off this uncomfortable costume and, you know, get comfortable and, you know, wear, wear your sweats and sit on a lazy boy and expect the, you know, the women that you were marching with to make dinner and, you know, bring you a drink. 
So is, is this the revolution? And, and that's why I say that unless we take that revolution home and keep it on and stop treating it like a pair of shoes or costumes, it will fail. Because what, would have, what we've essentially done, and we see this in Egypt especially, much, you know, and it pains me greatly, we've just replaced one patriarch with another. When we got rid of Hosni Mubarak, he was replaced by 19 Hosni Mubaraks in the military junta that ruled Egypt until we had presidential elections in the summer of 2012. And then we voted in Mohammed Morsi, who is from the Muslim Brotherhood, who do not espouse a very progressive social or feminist agenda. And he became our new patriarch. And then he, very ironically, promoted the man who was the head of the military intelligence. Now, this man's history, and this man is called Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, who's our current president in Egypt. But his history actually really encapsulates what I'm talking about very poignantly and very painfully. In March of 2011, less than a month after we got rid of Hosni Mubarak, Egyptian women and men were taken in from Tahrir Square as the military was trying to clear Tahrir. And they were taken to a military prison most of them were tortured, but the women were subjected to a very, very specific type of torture just for them as women, because they were subjected to what are known as quote-unquote virginity tests, which are essentially sexual assaults. And they were subjected to these tests in search of their hymen. That's why my book is called Headscarves and Hymens. Because the military claimed that if they didn't, the, the, the military first of all asked the women who were taken in who's married and who's not married. And the assumption here is who's a virgin and who's not a virgin. And when they were challenged about this afterwards, they said they did this because they didn't want any, anyone to accuse them of raping them. The assumption being that only a virgin can be raped. And we actually have this in many of the laws in our region that the, the prison sentence for raping a virgin is much harsher than the prison sentence for raping a woman who's not a virgin. So we're privileging the hymen here. We're privileging a certain kind of commodification of a woman's body, ownership of a woman's body. And the military went in search of this hymen using these virginity tests with the green light and the permission of the head of the military intelligence at the time, a man called Abdel Fattah Sisi, who is now a president. He was promoted by Mohammed Morsi to defense minister. And a year later, he overthrew Mohammed Morsi. So the patriarch, Mohammed Morsi, was overthrown by the patriarch, Abdul Fattah al-Sisi. So as I said, we keep replacing patriarchs, one with the other, one with the other. All of them with a very patriarchal, misogynistic view of women and our bodies. And one of the biggest fights that we've been having, as these so-called virginity tests clearly showed, but in, on a, in a more public setting, is who owns public space and whose bodies are safe enough to move around in public space. And again, unless we answer this question, is the revolution going to be taken off like a costume? Or are we going to keep it on at home? That public space is always going to belong to men. That public space is always going to belong to the patriarch. And that public space is always going to be incredibly dangerous for us. And so many women, including myself, will constantly pay a very physical toll for wanting to claim our space in that public space. For the revolution to go home, it must go home and challenge the patriarch, who is our father, who's our brother, who's our husband, and in many instances, who's our son. Because when I think of a country like Saudi Arabia, where I spent my teen years, women have to get the permission of a male guardian to basically do the most basic of things. Clearly, the patriarch is at work here. This is a conspiracy. <laughs> They're trying to sabotage my talk, but I shall continue. In Saudi Arabia, however, a son is often that guardian who is, whose permission is needed for a woman to travel abroad, for a woman to go to university, for a woman to even have surgery, a woman needs the signature of a male guardian. Father, brother, husband, or son. So what does it mean to take that revolution home and to make that revolution social and sexual? To answer that, I went, I visited Jordan and Tunisia and interviewed activists in Egypt, and li including Libyan activists in Egypt, for a documentary, a radio documentary that I made for the BBC. BBC World Service earlier this year. And I've included some of the findings from that documentary in my book, but the documentary is available as a two-part series online if, if you have 20, 40 minutes and you would like to hear me talk about this on the radio. But I'm going to summarize my opinions for you, uh, or what I found basically for you. Because I think each country 
answers in its own way what it will mean for the revolution to go from overthrowing the patriarch in the presidential palace to overthrowing and challenging the patriarch at home, be it in the bedroom, the dining room, the kitchen, wherever you want. Because each one of those countries lies on this spectrum of misogyny and patriarchy. And it, and it brings across the, the, the difficulties, sometimes the similarities. Obviously, not all countries in the region are the same. We're not monolithic. Each one, each of these countries has its own challenges. But a lot of those countries have, have a lot in common, especially when it comes to things like family law and the kind of legislation that is in effect when it comes to things like sexual violence and divorce and marriage. And again, that falls under family law. So I'll start with Jordan. And one of the main challenges for Jordan is that Jordan is a monarchy. A monarchy. And the monarchies in the region have reacted quite differently to the uprisings and the revolutions. Because the uprisings and the revolutions that have happened so far have happened in republics. And the way that the various monarchies in the region have reacted to the revolutions and uprisings is basically to create a small space as a kind of safety valve to allow their citizens room to breathe. And in the case of the more wealthier countries spending a lot of money on people, like in Saudi Arabia, for example. The Saudi king had just returned to Saudi Arabia after the various uprisings had begun, and he gave a lot of money to people. And he gave a lot of money to build mosques and a lot of money to the clerics, the support of, of whom the Saudi regime is very dependent upon. So Jordan was one of those monarchies where in order to tell people, OK, look, you know, we, we hear you. We hear that there's a certain level of, of discontent. The, the government, the cabinet was um, disbanded, was a new cabinet was put in place, and uh, parliamentary elections were held in which women had a quota of, I believe, between 12 to 14 percent, which was the highest number of seats reserved for women in the Jordanian parliament. Now, the problem in, in Jordan that, the, that I highlighted in the documentary was that in its penal code, Jordan allows rapists to escape conviction if they marry their victim. Now, this is obviously horrific. This is actually something that was introduced into many of the penal codes in various countries in the region during peri periods of colonization. So for example, in Morocco, it was introduced during French colonization. In Jordan, I'm not really sure the exact kind of trace of it, but I bring this up, and I will talk about this in, in a bit. I bring this up by way of reminding you that when we talk about feminism and patriarchy and misogyny, it's not about the people over there and how terrible it is over there, but it's about connecting over there with over here and recognize that globally, we're fighting misogyny and patriarchy that lies on a spectrum. But each, or, each one of us and each, each one of our communities lies on a different place along that spectrum for various reasons. So countries such as here and others that had revolutions several decades ago or you know, a uh, hundred years ago or whatever, they might be a bit further along on that spectrum, but we are by no means post-patriarchy or post-misogyny or post-anything in this country as the fights over reproductive rights and the rollback, the horrifying rollback of reproductive rights in the United States shows us. So I'm not here to talk to you about what, what we're fighting against in the Middle East and North Africa as a way of making you feel good and comfortable and happy about how great everything is here and how horrible it is over there, because nothing is achieved that way. I am, however, here to remind you of the very real kind of life and death struggles that you might not be facing now, some other women might be who have less privilege than you in parts of this country, where things like access to a legal and safe abortion is a life and death matter. So always think of these issues as lying on that spectrum, and as when we fight against those issues, regardless of where we stand on that spectrum, we strengthen each other because I like to think of feminism as a global thing, not as something that we just kind of marginalize and, and, and put in pockets according to where we happen to be, where we are. So back to Jordan. The, what, the, the biggest, one of the biggest challenges for women's groups there was to remove this article in the Jordanian law that allows a rapist to escape conviction if he marries his victim. Now this had happened in Morocco just a year before, because two young women committed suicide when they were forced to marry their rapists. And this led to protests in Morocco, and it led to Morocco repealing that, part, that article in its law. But, it, but from what I hear from various Moroccan activists, it hasn't completely disappeared. That kind of on the ground, kind of grassroots uh, upheaval is going to take a while. The legislation is important, and it's a start. But when you go into rural areas where things like family honor and the shame of rape 
and wanting to hide the fact that your daughter was raped, it continues. But at least we have legislation now that we can use to help those that we, we get to hear about. In Jordan, it hasn't been removed yet. And one of the things that adding this quota for women in, in parliament did was it allowed many more women into uh, the seat of a legislator. And I met one of those women who's leading the campaign to remove this article from the Jordanian law. And she told me, obviously, because we have more women in, Jordan in the Jordanian parliament now, they're more sympathetic to the, the removal of this law. We then went to interview the man who's head of the, the legislation committee. And being a man, he was quite blasé about this. He said, well, you know, I don't think this is very urgent right now. Um, you know, the laws are brought up, laws come about when a society wants to change things and we have to take into account the fact that this is a huge shame on the families and we're trying to help the families and it was always the family's well-being put ahead of the well-being of the survivor of rape. And in order to get to that, the well-being of the, the survivor of rape, we went to interview activists who actually work with these women who survived rape. And through them, we managed to interview a 17-year-old woman who was pressured into marrying her rapist. She didn't want to, but her family and his family pressured her into doing it. And you can imagine, obviously, the trauma of marrying the man who sexually violated you. And she had a terrible marriage. He was very physically abusive when they got married. And she very soon left him. And her mother told us for the, the, the documentary, I really regret forcing my daughter to do this. And we have to do something about our societies in which we basically sacrifice our daughters for, you know, to make our families look good for the sake of, you know, we don't want to lose face or, or lose honor in front of everybody because at the end of the day, her daughter's well-being was what she ended up sacrificing. So the activists on the ground there working against that legislation are heroes to me because they recognize what they're up against. They're up against patriarchs outside and inside. And they're trying to take that revolution home. And I asked one of them, uh, a, an attorney and a feminist called Eva Abu Halawi. And I said to her, you know, Eva, they often say that the revolution, uh, you know, it's not the time now to talk about feminism. It's not the time now to talk about women's issues. What do you think of that? And she said, well, if we keep talking about that, it's just going to stay on that, stay on that political level. And it's meaningless. It means nothing for the girls and women that I try to help. If all we tell them is, you know, fight the regime outside, when at home nothing has changed. Because you can be on the streets outside risking your life, but you go home and, and, and your life is, is sometimes risked double and triple in that place that is supposed to be a place of refuge and safety for you. So that was Jordan. And when, when we went to Tunisia, the concern there was very different. The concern there was who's going to have the most say about the constitution in a country that had been considered the most progressive when it came to women's rights in the region. So when Tunisians got rid of Ben Ali, they were very worried that a constitution that had been put into place in the 1950s and that banned polygamy and actually gave Tunisian women the right to a legal abortion before France gave women the right to a legal abortion. So basically, Tunisia, which is a former colony of France, gave Tunisian women reproductive rights before France did. So a lot of women in Tunisia were worried that even though the man who put this constitution in place turned into a dictator, Habib Bourgheba, they were worried that they would lose the secular and feminist advantages of this constitution. So um, we arrived in Tunisia very soon after they put into effect and, and voted for a constitution that for the first time in the Arab world guaranteed equality between men and women. Now this is unprecedented and it's historic and it's incredibly inspirational. And the way that they managed to do this in Tunisia was that secular women who were concerned about losing those rights in the constitution worked with Islamist women. They worked with the women of the Islamic movement called an nahda And the Islamic movement called an nahda is the movement that has the, the highest number of seats in the Tunisian constituent assembly. Not all of the women in an nahda are feminist and not all of them worked on getting this language into the constitution. But enough of them were working alongside secular women out of the recognition that if they lose those rights that they had in the Tunisian constitution, all of them will be affected. It doesn't matter anymore that you're secular or Islamist. What matters is you're a woman who wants to maintain this very progressive attitude that your constitution had. 
And I'm going to I'm going to talk to you about two women who I believe have definitely taken the constitution home. I mean, have taken definitely taken the revolution home. One of them is a young Tunisian woman called Amira Yahyawi, and I met her in a conference in London where we we spoke on a panel about women in the revolution. She lived in exile for a while when Ben Ali was still in power, but then went back to uh, to Tunisia after he was overthrown, and she launched the first non-governmental organization of its kind called al bawsala which means the compass in Arabic. And it's the first group that basically acts as a watchdog, mostly at you know overlooking and overseeing what the, the constituent assembly was doing. So if the constituent assembly was discussing some very problematic language, especially when it came to women, and the men were really digging in their heels, Amira and her co-workers were threatened to take their pictures and put them along the main avenues of the capital Tunis and right underneath, these are the men who don't want women to have equal rights. So basically naming and shaming. And once when she was in, um, the, during the early days of the Constituent Assembly, one of the members was a Salafist. And the Salafists are to the right wing of uh, Nahda. If you think of political Islam as, again, not being monolithic, but some being much more right wing than others, the Salafists are much more right wing and much more conservative than the Nahda. So Amira was asking a question to this Salafist member of the Constituent Assembly. And Amira addresses like I do. And he said to her, he kept ignoring her. So she said to him, why are you ignoring me? And he said to her, I don't speak to naked women. And she said to him, but I'm not naked. And he said to her, no, you're naked. You're not veiled and you're not dressed as a, a good, modest Muslim woman should. So she said to him, oh, you think I'm naked, do you? I'll show you naked. And she began to take her clothes off. She began to unbutton her coat. She began to unbutton her blouse. And this man was horrified. He was like, what are you doing? She said to him, I want you to understand what a naked woman looks like, because clearly you don't know. <laughs> so he said, OK, stop, stop. And, and he took her question. And by way of showing just you know this kind of weird and, and kind of very kind of heartwarming camaraderie that had built between them, because Amira would go every day, when finally the constitution was passed and they all voted for it, and it was, it was a very moving moment, Amira told me that you know, they were all standing crying. And she went to look for him, and he hugged her. So here's this man who was telling her, I don't speak to naked women. And she threatened to strip. And he hugged her because they were so happy and proud of this great constitution that they had worked on. Now, the other woman that, that I find very inspirational in Tunisia as well was somebody who personally surprised me because I'm not an Islamist. And I, and I oppose the inclusion of religion in politics. I, I, I'm not a fan or supporter of the Muslim Brotherhood. I obviously, I condemn wholeheartedly the violence and the massacre that the Egyptian regime enacted upon them last year when they cleared Rabah and Nahda Square. And I, I wholeheartedly condemn the, the imprisonment of them. All these political, de most of the political detainees in Egypt right now are from, from the Muslim Brotherhood solely on the basis of their political and religious ideology. Having said that, I am not a fan of political Islam. And I'm not a fan of including religion in politics. But I, I, I interviewed this woman that really challenged this for me. Because she was a woman called Fatoum. What's her name? Fatoum. Fatoum, I forget her family name, I'm sorry. I just, I didn't sleep very much last night and I missed the train and I'm jet lagged. So forgive me for acting like a, having a senior moment as I often say. If there are any seniors here, I don't mean any offense. <laughs> but um, so Fatoum, her history was, was very typical of women who belonged to the Islamic movement in Tunisia in that she was at university at a time when the headscarf was banned and she wanted to wear a headscarf. So she would wear a beret. She met and fell in love with a fellow law school uh, student, and they got, ma um, they got married and had children. And when the revolution happened and they got rid of Ben Ali, he encouraged her to run for the Constituent Assembly. And he said to her, I want you to be a member of this Constituent Assembly that writes our new constitution, because when you make it better for women, it will be better for everyone. And she came to our interview with her two children and her husband. And her husband basically came to babysit the children. So here is a man from an Islamic movement who came to babysit the children while his wife is being interviewed by the BBC World Service about how she helped to create the first constitution in the Arab world that makes men and women equal. And it was really beautiful to see. And her daughter, who's seven, was sitting there watching us and filming and taping the interview with an iPhone and watching the seven-year-old girl, seeing that her father was there babysitting her brother and her mother is being interviewed by the BBC. I mean, that is the revolution going home. Because this, this girl now is growing up at home with two parents who appreciate each other, 
who both come from a, a similar background, they're both attorneys, and in which the father is telling the mother, go and be a legislator and make it better for everybody in Tunisia. So that's, that's why we need the revolution to go home. That's why we need the revolution to, to, to cross that social and sexual threshold so that we, we can begin to nurture families like Fatoum's family in Tunisia. Now, this constitution in Tunisia has by no means ended all the problems that Tunisia has because what the next challenge is implementing language that sounds wonderful on paper, but what is it going to be like on the ground? Because as I said with Morocco, you've changed the law now to be more women friendly and less misogynist, but what it is, what's it going to be like in application? So I hope to go back to Tunisia soon to talk to, to interview the women that, that I interviewed for the, for the documentary and see how far they're coming along. And they've got uh, presidential elections coming up soon. And I'm glad to see that in Nahda, unlike the Muslim Brotherhood, the Muslim Brotherhood had promised they would not contest the presidency in Egypt, and, and obviously they did. And Nahda has said that they will not, and that they will stick to uh, the part, what, what, what they consider their parliament and future parliamentary elections. Now, if I take the, what we found and move eastward to Libya now, the main challenge for Libyan women, and it, this came through from the activists that we interviewed, is being caught between the, the, th the, the crossfire of, of many types of violence. Women everywhere, obviously, have to contend with sexual violence on the street from anybody. But in Libya especially, it's, it's a particular kind of violence from militias, very heavily armed militias, who for those of you who follow the news in Libya will know now, uh, are contest, basically, Libya has two, two groups of people claiming to both be the rulers of Libya, and apparently the Egyptian regime is helping one side to bomb the other side. So it's a, it's a very, very precarious situation. And in situations like that, it is always women and children who pay the highest price. And even before this happened, because our interviews were in, in March, so this was before the militias um, burned, one militia burned the airport and another militia took over in Benghazi. Before that, the two feminist activists that we, I interviewed one of them in Tripoli by Skype, and the other one was in Cairo. And the one that I interviewed in Cairo was actually there because her father, had received a message from a militia basically threatening her well-being. And the way that they threaten families with the well-beings of their daughters isn't just that we will kidnap them, as some of them, the, the men are threatened with, but you will know what, and, and the message delivered to her father was, and you know what happens to women when they get kidnapped in this country. The unsaid being that she will be raped and, and possibly killed. And both of these women said these militias combine the worst of basically a weaponized culture, but also a culture, because some of the militias are Islamists, so militias that use both religion and weapons as weapons against women. And that, that's possibly the worst combination you can imagine. And one of them told me about a, a, a leaflet that she had found outside a school in, in Tripoli that horrified her because she was born and raised in Tripoli and she'd never seen anything like this before. And the leaflet basically was this kind of um, imagined dialogue or, or kind of soliloquies rather from first of all a rose and the rose would say um, you can see me on every street corner you can buy me for I don't know how many dinars everybody sees me the unsaid being I am cheap and available to everybody and then the next kind of soliloquy was from a pearl and the pearl says I am ensconced in my shell I am protected from the eyes of everybody. Nobody has access to me. I am precious. And the, and, and the unsaid here is, if you veil, you are respected, you are honored. But if you don't veil like the flower, you are cheap and everybody can get at you. And this was being distributed outside schools of, of, uh, for basically um, elementary and middle schools. And she was telling me that girls as young as six years old are being forced to veil. Now, this is a woman born and raised in Tripoli, a feminist, who says this is completely alien to the, the Libya that she knows. And very soon after the, the interviews that we conducted with these two women, their predictions and their fears came horrifically true when a leading women's rights activist called Salwa Bourayes was assassinated in Benghazi. Now, Sal Salwa became one of the many spokespeople of the revolution. She would often appear on television to explain why Libyans were rising up against 42 years of Gaddafi dictatorship. And she actually went back to Benghazi to vote. And just a few hours after she voted for their then parliamentary elections, gunmen stormed her home, 
and basically emptied their rifles into her. And she was known for her work, especially on women's rights. And a few weeks after Salwa was assassinated, a female parliamentarian was stopped while she was driving through the streets, I think of, it was Tripoli, and also assassinated. So this, this is women basically, again, coming or, or basic paying their, for their lives because they're in that crossfire between the various militias who use both religion and violence against them. If I then take it to Egypt, the main challenge that we found in Egypt was safety in the streets, claiming public space, and sexual violence. Now, because more and more women have been speaking out about sexual violence in Egypt for many years now, we have kind of a, a, a twofold situation. First, it seems like sexual violence is everywhere and has increased, which it has. But it's also the reason that we're hearing more and more about it isn't just that it has increased, and, and it does speak to this very, very kind of deep-seated fear of a lot of men who don't want women in public space. But the other reason that we're hearing a lot about it is because it's not new. And we've been hearing from more and more women that encourages others to speak out since 2005. And often when people talk about sexual violence in Egypt, they will just tie it to the January 25th, 2001 uprising revolution. But it actually predates that. And if you go all the way back to 2005, the Mubarak regime, because 2005 was a year of great street protests and a lot of kind of political ferment in Egypt. And the Mubarak regime using plain clothes thugs that work with them as well as uniformed officers would target women journalists and activists for sexual violence. And then, and, and that year was the first year we saw women on our televisions, women activists talking about sexual violence and what it was like to, to experience it. The year after that, we had regular Egyptian men on the street sexually assaulting women during Eid, the religious festival after Ramadan. And the way that I connect those two in order to take it back home now, to, to taking the revolution home, is when the regime sexually violates your body, as it did in 2005, it gives a green light that women's bodies are fair game. That it's okay for anyone to violate a woman's body, especially if no one is held accountable for it. Women tried to hold the regime accountable because they had video evidence, but the regime wouldn't take it seriously and said that there wasn't enough evidence. So the regime does that and it gives a green light that women's bodies are available. And the next year, who violates women's bodies? The street does. This is now civilians, regular Egyptian men. And that's where I make that connection. Because I began my talk by telling you the political revolution is both of us marching together, men and women, side by side. That's in recognition of the, the fact that the regime oppresses everybody. But what happened in 2005 and then 2006, the regime violating our bodies and then the street violating our bodies, is a reminder that when we get rid of that patriarch and the presidential palace, we have another revolution that as women we have to fight for. And that is the revolution against the patriarch, which is both the regime and the ordinary men who believe that it's, it's okay to violate our body. That's why the revolution has to go home, because we recognize that it's society at large discriminates against us. The regime discrim oppresses everybody, society oppresses women. And that's why the revolution has to go home. And in Egypt, there are signs that the revolution is beginning to go home, but we have a long way to go. And I mentioned the groups that work on the ground against sexual violence, who very courageously put activists out there, especially during protests. We haven't had protests in a long time in Egypt now because we have a very draconian law that was passed a few months ago under the Sisi presidency that it effectively bans all forms of protests. So we're now talking about regular street violence, which is still epidemic. To, to leave my house just to go grocery shopping in Egypt is a battle of wills. It's like I'm entering a war zone. Everybody has something to say about your body, and if it just stops us at the words, that is good. Everybody also feels that they have, they have access to your body. You'll be groped, you'll be sexually assaulted, and with very little accountability. A law was recently put into effect after women were horribly assaulted by a mob during celebrations after Sisi was elected. But many of us are concerned about how that law will be put into effect. Am I going to be able to go up to a police? Am I going to be able to take someone who assaults me on the street, whether verbally or physically, to a police station and say, pass charges against this man? There was a, a journalist who was groped on an Egypt air flight a few days ago. She was on her way back to Cairo from Nairobi, and she was asleep. And an Egyptian man sitting next to her, she woke up with an Egyptian man groping her leg under the blanket. And so she insisted on, on passing charges against this man. And on every level, every step of the way, she was being discouraged from passing charges. 
by the flight attendants, by the police that she insisted wait for her at the airport. And one of the reasons that she was able to, to push it so far was that she wasn't Egyptian. She was a US citizen. And which saddens me as an Egyptian that it takes a foreign, it, it, it takes a foreigner to make our government and our police take sexual assault seriously. But this man, the way that this man tried to handle it, he basically pleaded with her to drop the charges because he faces several months in, in jail, possibly, I think, up to three years. Because he said to her, please think of my family and my children. And clearly, he didn't think of his family and his children when he was groping her. So to take that revolution home and make men think of us and, uh, as equals and think of their families before they sexually violate other women, it's really important for me that we disengage from this idea that we tell men on the street what if she was your mother? What if she was your sister? What if she was your daughter? I hate this idea because what this idea implies is this woman has to be related to a man and therefore respected and honored through her family connections in order for you to respect her personal autonomy and in order for you to respect her bodily integrity. So what I would like to do by way of taking the revolution home is to start asking people, is he your father? Is he your brother? Is he your son? who's committing this sexual violence. Because when you do that, you put the onus on the men. Because we have so much victim blaming, globally, obviously, when it comes to sexual assault, it's time to start putting the focus on the men who, who perp perpetrate the sexual assault, not the women. And I deserve to be able to walk through the streets of my country and any other country with my body intact and without being sexually violated, whether I'm somebody's sister, mother, wife or not, just because I'm a human being whose bodily integrity is important. One of the ways that I'm trying to take the revolution home on a personal level, beyond my writing and making documentaries that I, make, I made for the BBC, was I moved back to Cairo last year to write this book, but I also launched or, or put together a women's support group. And this support group functions has a dual function. One, one of them is a very selfish reason, and that is in the run-up to the anniversary of my assault, which is almost upon us because it was on the day before Thanksgiving, I totally fall apart, and it always takes me by surprise. I mean, you know, I talk about my sexual assault very openly, and I talk about how there's no shame in talking about sexual violence, and the shame belongs to the men who violated my body. I can do all of that. But when the anniversary of my assault comes along, I, I fall apart. I can't sleep. It's like I have to stay up all night to basically kind of stand watch over me as if I need to protect myself from further violations. And I know because a, woman, a women's rights group that tried to raise my case and, uh, and sue the Egyptian interior ministry for me, that 12 other women were sexually assaulted in a very similar way to, to, to the way I was in Mohammed Mahmoud Street. But we don't know any of them and none of them has spoken. Not because they're voiceless, because this idea that people are voiceless and we give a voice to the voiceless, that's a ridiculous notion. Everybody has a voice. But the fact that we haven't heard from, the, from these women is, reminds us why we think they're voiceless. Because their families won't let them speak. Because they're ashamed to speak. Because it's, it's such a taboo to speak. And I, and I thought, you know, if I, if I had access to these women in the run-up to the anniversary of our assault, we could, we could strengthen each other, we could hold each other up. We could definitely be the, the truest sense of a support group. Until I find them, I have another kind of support group. And, and the support group as it, as it functions now is basically a consciousness aware, awareness group. Kind of think of before many of you in this room were born in the 1970s when all these feminist groups would get together in California. You know, they give each other mirrors and speculums and say, you look up your vagina and see what nobody but your OBGYN can see and all that kind of stuff, you know. Consciousness raising as a way of encouraging women to take back their bodies and, and, and to enter feminism from a, a very kind of willful and conscious way. Now, I, had, I do not distribute mirrors or speculum in my support group, but what we end up doing is discussing a lot of things that are often not discussed. And the wonderful thing about the group is they're between the age of 19 to 35. The youngest, the 19-year-old, I first encountered when we had a discussion on sexual violence, a feminist group that I spoke, I, I led this discussion. And she got up, she's only 19, and you're not um, recognized as an adult in Egypt until you turn 21. So she got up and she said to me, I am so angry. Nobody understands how angry I am. And, and this was Sehmet right here, the rage of Sehmet, what I told you about earlier at the beginning of my talk, tapping into this kind of rage that we're not allowed to tap into these days because we're, you know, we're supposed to be nice and polite. And I always say fuck nice and polite because nice and polite brings you nothing. 
no nice and polite. This respectability politics is, is, is going to be the death of us. There's nothing respectable about violating my body, and so there shouldn't be anything respectable or anything expected of me that is respectable as I fight back. So this 19-year-old stands up and she says, I am so angry, and nobody understands how angry I am. And she gives me the list of reasons why she's angry. She wants to remove her headscarf, and her mother won't let her. Her father beats her consistently, and she said, I want to run away. Do you think I should run away? I was like, whoa. I was like, okay, this is psychology one-on-one. -on -one. I cannot tell you what to do. But I said to her, you're here for a reason. I said to her, you know the answer to your own question, and you came here knowing the answer to your own question. And about two months after that, she did run away, which is unprecedented in Egypt. Very few people, let alone young women, leave home. In Egypt, we stay with our families until we get married. Some people have started to move out of home and live alone, but it's, it's, it's very, very rare. And she took off her headscarf. I've heard recently, though, that because she's not of age, her family has taken her back home. But this woman, when, when we were making the documentary, was sitting next to the oldest woman in the group, who's 35 years old. And the 35-year-old, when I asked her, what has the revolution, how has the revolution affected you? And have you taken the revolution home? She said to me, yes. She said, you know, the revolution now makes me demand people, demand respect from people. She used to wear a headscarf. Now, I'm not connecting headscarves with lack of liberation or vice versa. But for this particular woman, taking off her headscarf was the way that she liberated herself. And she said she took it off after the revolution. And she traveled for the first time in her life alone when she was 34 years old. And there was this wonderful moment when the 19-year-old was describing to us what she did, where the 35-year-old turned to her and she said to her, how did you do this? How can you do this at 19? I wasn't anything like you at the age of 19. I'm just now trying to explain to my mother that I smoke because she doesn't know that I smoke and I'm like, I'm doing it behind her. So these, are the, the, these women, when we get together once a week and they bring their problems into the group, one of them when it would explain to me, one of them often comes to me and she goes, Mona, you know what? Women like you and me are just never meant to get married. And I was like, hallelujah, that is true. And she would explain to me, you know, all the frustrations that she goes through with all these men who are initially attracted to this liberated, professional, autonomous woman. And then two months into it, he wants her to stop going out with her guy friends. He wants her to start wearing a headscarf. He wants us to stop posting pictures of her in mixed groups on Facebook. And she's like, what is he trying to do? And I'll say to her, you know, I think he's internalized the patriarchy of our culture. And he's confused because he's attracted to an independent woman. But our culture tells him, you have to be in charge. So at the end of the day, when we take that revolution home, not only are we saving our bodies from various forms of violations, but we're saving our men as well. Because we're saving our men from ultimately this, this deep-seated schizophrenia that tells them you have to treat women in this way. And that way is often at a deep conflict with the kind of women that they're attracted to. Now, you often hear that patriarchy is bad for everyone. I have problems with that statement because it's obviously much worse for women than it is for men. But at the end of the day, and this is why I say the revolution has to go home, and I'll wrap up here because I want to take questions. Am I due to wrap up? Um, at the end of the day, feminism is good for everybody. At the end of the day, when you look here as people of the United States, and I'm one of them, when you see a map of the United States and you see the rollback of reproductive rights, understand that it affects people even if it doesn't affect people in your own personal circle. Because who, who's rolling back those reproductive rights? It's the men of the religious right. Who are the men of the religious right that I fight back home in Egypt? And the men of the religious rights across the world all have one thing in common. And that one thing is they're trying to control our vaginas. And I always tell them wherever I go, stay out of my vagina unless I want you in there. Thank you. Uh, so now we'll take a few questions. Tommy will be running around with a wireless mic. Um, if you could please just raise your hand if you have a question and he will be promptly over.
right? I think one really important thing, and I, and I didn't talk about the role of headscarves here in the US uh, as much, so now I'll, I'll kind of, I'll touch on it briefly, is to recognize the context that we're talking about. Because when I, when I talk about the context in Egypt especially, I look around and I see that the majority of women, Muslim women, are in headscarves. So we're beyond this notion of choice now, because I, you know, a lot of a lot of times this notion of choice is held up, and we fetishize it. And like, you know, as long as a woman has chosen to do something, it, you cannot critique it or or criticize it or di or disagree with it. And I, I've gotten to the stage of my feminism where I don't necessarily agree with everything a woman does, and I don't think that any every choice a woman exercises is necessarily a feminist choice. So when I look at the, the headscarf in the Egyptian context, I believe we're beyond choice. And I believe if we're really honest as well, one of the, one of the reasons that sexual violence in Egypt has been on the increase is that the more women veil, the more we're sending a message to men that we are, we're going to, it's not that we're being policed, but we're policing ourselves for them. Because it's this idea that, it's actually a very, very insulting idea to men, that they can't control themselves and women have to be. That's not the only reason that women veil, but I've heard from many women that the reason that they started veiling is because they want to be safe when they walk through the streets. Okay, but this is really counterproductive, because how much are you going to cover up in order to be totally safe? And obviously, again, no society is free of sexual violence. But at what point do men then become responsible for their own behavior, especially in countries that don't have legislation to protect women from sexual violence? So it, it's a very, very difficult point. And, I've, and I used to wear a headscarf myself. I wore a headscarf for nine years. Now, I chose to wear this headscarf, but it's so difficult to remove a headscarf in my own cultural and faith background. I often tell people it took me eight years to take it off because I was taught as a Muslim that it's better not to wear the headscarf at all than to wear it and then remove it. So having said that and, and seeing the context in which the majority of women wear it, it's, it's a very, very com complex and difficult scenario where now more and more women are saying, okay, as part of the revolution, my own personal freedom is to take it off. And I'm seeing it happen more and more. I'm meeting more and more, especially young women who are taking it off. When I take the context of the headscarf to here, to the United States, it's, um, for many women that I meet, it's less of a religious thing than, a, than an identity politics thing. My sister, for example, wears a headscarf. She's doing a PhD at Northwestern. And she began wearing the headscarf as a religious thing, but she no longer believes it's a religious thing. But she keeps the headscarf because she wants people to recognize her as a Muslim. So in, in that context, it's not about protecting her body from sexual violence. It's much more the identity politics of it. And I'm hoping that, again, if, if we exercise this idea of global feminism where everybody fights for a greater space of feminism in their own kind of cultural context here, I'm hoping the more we see Muslim American women veil for non-religious reasons, we will begin to divorce the veil from a religious thing. So that if somebody like this 19-year-old wants to take her veil off in Egypt, she is able to see an example of a fellow Muslim woman that has removed it and, and it has nothing to do with religion. So she can then turn to her family and say, look, it's not a religious thing. Now we're not, we're, we're kind of quite far away from that, but I'm hoping that we complicate the veil through that, because the veil needs to be complicated. Again, I, as I said, not everyone wears it for religious reasons. Some women wear it because they just don't want to keep up with the latest fashion. Some women wear it because they were forced to wear it. Some women fight with their families so that they can wear it. But my own conclusion, I began to wear the veil at six, at the, the hijab at 16. I took it off at 25. I'm now 47. I'm now at the point where, and this is something that I, I discuss at length in my book, where I believe this whole idea of modesty is a patriarchal construct that we have to, we have to challenge head on. And, and, and to, to look at a woman's body and the way that patriarchy wants to construct it in different ways, whether through hypersexualization or hypermodesty, as two sides of one coin. And if we're going to, you know, criticize the hypersexualization, then we must criticize the, the what what in the U.S. now we call purity culture. And so I'm, I'm, I'm actually really grateful that we have a term for it now. Because if you take purity culture here in the US, which is again something that we used to describe the religious right and the way that they deal with things like virginity and sex and women's modesty, take that and it's basically my entire context in the Middle East and North Africa. But I like to take that over there and discuss it and see how purity culture affects things like sexual violence and the lack of responsibility for men. So it's a bit of a complicated answer 
for you, but it's, it's a complicated issue. And I personally, I'm, I'm coming out against much more these days, this idea that modesty must be respected and it's a good thing. Yes. a very problematic history, mostly because of where, during second wave feminism that was that is often described as a very kind of white kind of feminism, where you had a lot of white feminists who who, were, who seemed to own feminism, and you had um, uh, sometimes you'd have a cultural relativism that was often kind of twinned with that, which honestly didn't help anyone. But it was this idea that you had to respect all cultures and you had to respect anything that was done by women and for women which you know, women of those various cultures would often say, no, this is not something that we want to be respected. And it was a huge fight among uh, feminists of color and white women. But I can see where white feminists came from because they also didn't want to tread on cultural sensitivities and be called racist, which they were being called at the time. So it's something that I approach very, very carefully. And I think for me, as someone of Egyptian and Muslim descent, and, and someone who's very cognizant of that history of, of the racism and you know who owns racism uh, who owns sorry feminism one of my biggest kind of intellectual and feminist mentors who I very luckily happened to meet in New York about 10 days ago and fangirled over very embarrassingly is bell hooks because I love bell hooks work because what bell hooks did was and this is something it's a message that I've taken in my book and, and I, I, it informs a lot of my my writing lately is bell hooks has said do not privilege racism over sexism so you, and that's what I try to do in all my work and, and in envisioning that kind of um, transnational feminism. I'm more interested in, for example, a panel that Bell Hooks had on transgressive sexuality, where she spoke and a black lesbian writer spoke and a black trans man spoke and uh, a writer called Samuel Delaney who is biracial, but whose work on transgressive sexuality goes way back and, and was, he himself is a mentor to Bell Hooks. And I, I, I made a comment during that panel that ended up actually creating for me a very kind of harmonious transnational group of feminists on the ground after the panel. Because when I said that, I, said, I, I basically said to them, look, as an Egyptian who is, is fighting against um, conservative ideas of sexuality, as an, an Egyptian woman who consciously moves beyond just talking about sexual violence and the pain of sexual violence into talking about pleasure and desire and being a very openly sexual woman and saying, I have sex, I have desire, because I cannot stop at just the misery and the pain of sexual violence. It meant a lot to me to see people of color and black writers on this panel talk about this, because I can take that context where you know they, they had a woman, a West Indian Catholic woman stand up and say, look, just being here at your panel is, is transgressive. Because if my family finds out I'm at a transgressive sexuality panel, it's so taboo. Now, if that panel was white, and I took that panel home, and I said, oh, I went to this great panel, the, the quickest way people will dismiss it was, well, of course, it's white people. This is what they do. You know? And this is how a lot of LGBT groups are shut down, by saying this is just a, a white Western construct, which is false, right? So I'm not saying that we need to consciously keep out white feminists. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that I need to find feminists whose cultural and faith context is similar to mine, so I can take that complexity. I need complexity. So I'm in touch, so, so the group who came around me after I made that comment was uh, an Indian Muslim woman, uh, two African American students in New York, and an Egyptian woman. And immediately, our context was very clear to, to, to ourselves. You know, we come from conservative backgrounds. If our parents, if our respective parents knew we were at a transgressive sexuality com um, panel, all hell would break loose. But it's something that we want to organize around. So I, I, I'm saying that by way of, of, of trying to touch on that complexity, trying to talk to Indian feminists about how do you raise this issue of gang rape in Indian societies. South African feminists that I know who went through their own revolution to overthrow apartheid only to watch the men push them aside as some men are trying to do to us in the Middle East and North Africa. And having these South African women tell me, 
watch what the men will do because they will ally with each other even if they have political differences just to push you out of the scenario. So I need women who have that complexity. And then when I'm asked abroad, what can I do to help you? I say, do nothing to help me. Help your own community because when you help your own community, I can look at you from over there and say, look, these women are fighting against the Todd Aitkins who believe that if you're legitimately raped, your body shuts down, which is sheer and utter shit, obviously. It's not even scientific to begin with. But when, I call, when women here call out this religious political nonsense, I can call out religious political nonsense in Egypt as a form of you know, allegiance to them and say, look, I have an ally over there. But the last thing we need is any kind of white savior narrative, which is one of the main reasons that a lot of our communities reject feminism, because they think it's one of the ways that the Western imperialism basically creates a, a foothold. So do you know what I mean? We, we need to make these kind of complex alliances in which we recognize that it, we have multiple identities that must be recognized. Yes? That's a really tough question, and you know, greater minds than mine <laughs> have not come up with, you know, lately anyway, uh, a way to kind of end once and for all this. What does feminism mean? But feminism for me means the liberation of women in whatever context context that you're in. In my own particular and complex and kind of like multiple identity uh, uh, definitions of feminism, it, it also has to do with where I am. And so I often describe how my, my battle for feminism in Egypt is to fight it along very secular grounds that, that don't draw on religion or don't draw on need to constantly make reference to religion to justify my feminism and to be accepted as that, to be accepted with a woman as a woman with red hair and two tattoos in a culture that doesn't necessarily approve of that for a woman, to be a woman who's very openly sexual and a woman who very openly says we cannot just stop at discussing sexual violence and breaking the taboo about sexual violence. We must continue all the way to talk about sex and desire and pleasure. And then finding examples of my own heritage from Arab erotica from the 10th century, for example, that is conveniently being forgotten. But when I come here to the US, my, my feminism doesn't change, but the context in which I'm operating changes. And so I find that here in the US, my feminism is married with that fight against racism that Bell Hooks talks about in a way that it isn't necessarily so in Egypt. So here, in, for example, I don't, go, I don't wear, wear a headscarf because I want people to recognize me as a Muslim. I actually want people to recognize this as a Muslim. I want people to recognize that a woman with red hair and tattoos can be a Muslim even though it's a fight back in Egypt. I want it to be recognized as such. And I will fight the religious right wing as in the same way that I fight the religious right wing in, in Egypt. Because if I'm not going to privilege racism over sexism, what I end up doing is, and this I do very consciously because it's absolutely necessary to my work, is I place myself in the middle between two right wings. An internal right wing, my own Muslim right wing, which is very misogynist, and will use the fact that the external right wing is Islamophobic and anti-Arab in my own context to shut down my feminism. So they will say, stop talking about feminism and what happens in our own cultural context because you're making us look bad. Stop talking about sexual violence because you're just adding to the, to the um, anti-Arab discrimination and men are going to think, people are going to think that all Arab men are barbaric and savage. That's not my place, you know. You, you want people to stop thinking of sexual violence and associating with you, you go fight it. But that's my internal right wing. So I fight them at the same time that I fight the external right wing, which is Islamophobic and racist. And I fight them through things like I got arrested two years ago for spray painting over a racist and bigoted ad in the New York subway that was put up by a racist right wing hate group. And I fought it as an Egyptian and as a Muslim and as a feminist. And the wording of this ad was, in the war between the civilized man and the savage, always choose the civilized man, support Israel, defeat jihad. And I saw this ad and I was like, 
fuck no. There is no way I am going to be passing this ad in the New York subway and not do something about it. And the reason that I did something about it, or, or, or how I did something about it, also taps into very feminist and very anti-racist things that have been used in this country and, and that have made this country what it is, and that is non-violent civil disobedience. There is a long and rich history of civil disobedience in this country, be it the civil rights movement, be it for feminism, be it in, stand, in fighting wars. So here my feminism is complicated by other factors because I fight the internal right wing, I fight the external right wing, neither of them is my friend. I will not take the side of either one to fight the other because if I choose the enemy of my enemy here, I end up dying. So, so see, I'm still a feminist. I'm a feminist in Egypt, but I, I, I try to find there the things that, essentially what I'm saying is, I love being on the margins. Do you know Gloria Anzaldúa, the Chicana lesbian writer? She wrote a great book called Borderlands, La Frontera. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful book that talks about these multiple levels of identity that we have. And she basically says, the most creative and kind of full of <coughs> ferment, fermentation area that you can be on is the border, the borderland. And for her, the border was the border between Mexico and the United States, because she, she was a Chicana. But I see women like Bell Hooks and Audrey Lord and other women, women of color, black women, Chicana women, lesbian women, women of various minorities who have traditionally been marginalized, reveling in that marginal status. And, and I love to be the outsider. I love to be on that, on that edge. I love to be on that border. Because that border allows me to find, in my context, the things that hurt, and I like to hurt. And I provoke them, and I push them. So I'm still a feminist, but I just find, according to the context where I'm at, I find the place that hurts, and I push. Now, other people's definition of feminism might not be the same, but at the end of the day, it's the way that I liberate myself. It's the way that I liberate myself from, from the, the right wing that surround me on both sides. So that's my very long definition of feminism. Yes? Um, I had an experience when I was in high school in which essentially if my male principal would come around to various classrooms in like the spring or summer to call girls who were wearing shorts out into the hallway and make them like stand there and measure if our shorts were like appropriate dress code length, like, which I thought was like pumped up. So totally. understandably, I wanted to like do something about it. And I was kind of shocked by how many of my female peers were just like, you're making too big a deal, you're overreacting, it's not a deal. Mm -hmm. And like, I just, how do you even start to convey to, and this is a public school in central Connecticut, right? You know, people are fairly, I don't know, not progressive, and not super conservative. How do you even start to convey to them that like, no, you can't take the fact that you're allowed to wear shorts for granted, we still have such a far way to go, when they probably think that, you know, feminism or the fight for women's rights is like, it, it, you know, it, what you say is absolutely essential. This, uh, this complacency, you know, complacency is really dangerous. To think that you're post anything, anywhere, is really dangerous. We are not post-racist in this country or post-feminist feminist in this country. I mean, just two days ago, a feminist writer had to cancel her talk at, uh, at the uh, university in Utah because she got a death threat from one of those guys in Gamergate. I don't know if you guys are following this case, but this guy threatened a massacre on a campus because it's an open carry uh, state and she didn't feel that the police were going to protect her, and she canceled her talk. Now, this is 2014 USA, in which a man wrote an email calling her a bitch and saying, feminists have ruined my life. Feminists have ruined my life. This is in the US in 2014, and threatening a massacre with weapons. So we're, we're not post anything. And I think what you touched on there is really essential, that but the people will often say, oh, come on, you're making a big deal of it, because when you agitate, what you do is you remind people that they're not, and it forces them to ask why. And so, I mean, in, in my context, I often say that, you know, if, if I fight against misogyny of any kind, be it against these ideas of modesty or sexual violence or pleasure and sex and all of that, I'm reminding people that they're not free. And when someone reminds you that you're not free, you're going to do one of two things. You're going to go out there and try to be free, which requires a form of activism that will make you go out, and that's not easy. Or you're going to try and shut the person up. You're going to shoot the messenger because they don't want to be reminded that they're not, they're not free. And I think also what happens in, in, in this country and other countries where it seems like we've won the big battles of feminism it, is that it's much easier to look at other cultures and other countries where things are bad and forget that we lie on this spectrum. 
And so they'll tell you, oh, come on, at least you can wear the shorts. You're not in a burqa, you know, like Afghanistan. So it's, it, it's, not that, it's not about that. It's not about comparing how bad it is over there to how great it is here. That's why when people ask me, how can I help you? I say, don't. Help yourself. Because a feminist had to cancel a lecture at a university in Utah or else face a massacre, because women's reproductive rights are being rolled back, because girls are being pulled out of class and shamed. This is basically, you know, body shaming and body policing in the US. So I think it, it's very important to fight complacency of any kind and, you know, keep at it. And people will always talk. When I spray painted over that ad, I was disheartened by the number of people on the left who were supposed to be my allies who said things like, your vandalism was off-putting. And I would say, excuse me, the racism and the bigotry is not off-putting, but my vandalism is off-putting. Okay. So keep at it. Yes. That's always the most difficult question I get. You know, have the, have, have the revolutions made it worse for women? And my first answer is no, they haven't. Because if we keep, if we allow a dictator to continue in the presidential palace oppressing us all, then we're never free on any level. But I say all of this in the recognition that we as women have a double revolution. Because like you said, the <coughs> secular dictator oppresses everybody. Yes, that's why we can go out on the street and march against him. But nonetheless, at fa in my family, in my home, despite the secular dictator, despite some very lovely language in his very progressive constitution, women were still being repressed. And uh, you know, a lot of these societies are often portrayed as very liberal and progressive. But when you scratch the surface and you look at legislation, you look at, for example, personal or family law in all of these countries, regardless of whether they're monarchies or they're uh, run by nominally secular dictators. Here's the thing about secular dictators in the Middle East and North Africa. They're ostensibly secular, right? And they've modernized a, lo a lot of the, of the legal system. But when it comes to women and children, they still refer to each of their religious backgrounds. So he's not so Mr. Secular here anymore, you know? Whether he's the king or he's the, the president. So you have to recognize that we have this double revolution. I, I, cannot, I cannot be silent and I cannot be free as long as any kind of dictatorship is in place. But be it secular or religious, is always, there's always a double revolution that as a woman I have to fight. And that's, why, that's one of the reasons that I, I said that I oppose political Islam, because I, I oppose the inclusion of religion in any religion, in politics, because I lived in Israel for a while. Israel is known as a Jewish state. And when I lived in West Jerusalem, and, and a, a lot of my neighbors in West Jerusalem were ultra-Orthodox Jews. And the ultra-Orthodox Jews and the Salafis in Saudi Arabia and the Salafis in Tunisia, those ultra-right-wing conservative Muslims, are almost identical in, in the way in their views towards women, in their views towards families, and, and all of this. And so, I, and this is, it was one of the most eye-opening experiences for me to see how I will often have more in common with a progressive Jew or a Christian or a Hindu or a Buddhist than I will with someone who's conservative. And, and they will have in common as well. That's why I say the religious right wing here and the religious right wing there both have a lot more in common than I have with the people of my own cultural faith background. So I, I would like to leave religion out of politics generally because I, I don't know, honestly, of a religion that is woman friendly. People will sometimes tell me, Wiccan, you know, the Wiccan religion. But, you know, other than that, unless we're going to go back to worshipping goddesses, I don't know of any religion that is friendly to women. Most religions privilege men, especially monotheistic religions. So, and this is not my call to go out there and, you know, and, and do, uh, you know, en masse atheism. I'm not encouraging all of you to abandon all religion and become atheists. I'm not. I'm, I'm being pragmatic and recognized and asking you to recognize that, yes, religions do privilege men, especially monotheistic religions. They privilege men over women. And my fight when I fight alongside Islamic feminists, I don't call myself an Islamic feminist. I'm a Muslim and a feminist. But when I fight along those who do connect the two together, 
I fight in the recognition that we have to we have to bring up and, and kind of and, and bring back these ideals of justice and mercy that we keep saying our religion practices, but I don't see being practiced when it comes to women's rights. So yeah, it's a double revolution, always, always. And, and if an Islamist is in power, it's sometimes a triple revolution. But here's something about the, the, the dictators. Huh? Muhammad Morsin and Abdul Fattah Sisi are both authoritarian and they're both misogynists. And they're two sides of one coin. As I told you, Sisi gave the green light to the virginity tests. And Morsi promoted Sisi knowing he did this, right? So Islamist rule, military rule, for me, both authoritarian, both misogynists, and both must be overthrown. Uh, back there and then to you. Yes. 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 difficult because when I watch Beyonce and I watch the influence that Beyonce has on so many young women that I know, especially women of color, specifically black women who have problems identifying with feminism and have problems with that history of racism that, fa that some feminist strains had and, and also women who come from more working class backgrounds who have problems, for example, with Cheryl, Cheryl uh, what's her name, Cheryl Sandberg and her lean in kind of feminism, which they will critique as a neoliberal kind of capitalist woman of privilege kind of feminism that is not available to a lot of women who come from more disadvantaged backgrounds. So I see, I see what Beyonce represents to them and I see what, how important Beyonce is to a lot of younger black women who who have hesitated in the past in the way that Bell Hooks often talks about how difficult it can be for black women to identify as feminist. And that's why this word womanist came about, because it was a way for black women to identify as feminist but not link themselves to this history that many of them see of, of uh, racism in largely white feminist movements. But then when, when it comes to the same issue of, of Beyonce, uh, oh, and also what I appreciated about what she did was when she introduced so many young women, especially to Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, and, and her, this fantastic walk, uh, talk that Chimamanda gave, a TEDx talk from a couple of years ago about why we should all be feminist. And, and if you go to, now Beyonce uses a, a certain section from that talk, it's now available as an ebook. but what Chimamanda did was beautiful. She speaks as a Nigerian woman, and how from her Nigerian background, her own cultural context, she's often derided for being a feminist because she's, um, people will say things like, well, that's a, a white woman thing. And she'll say, no, I'm Nigerian, I'm black, and feminism is mine, in the way that Bell Hooks did. And then people will say to her things like, well, you know, that must mean that you hate men and you don't want to get married and you just want to be a lesbian. And, she's, and she'll say things like, well, there's nothing wrong with being a, a lesbian if that's, what, that's how you identify. And it's not about hating men or rejecting marriage, but what it is about is um, stop, let's stop raising our girls to just aspire to just marriage and compete with each other over men Let's allow a, a, a girl and a young woman to understand that she can grow up to become married or not become married. So I appreciate that Beyonce gave a lot of young women a doorway into Chimamanda and, in her, and her ideas that they normally would never have seen. So it's a lovely marriage of pop culture and literature and that more global feminism that can start to make the kind of alliances that the young woman up there asked me about, where we can reach out and recognize each other's work. But. My own context with Beyonce is, but, but this again, uh, within the black community, it means something different. I don't believe that your sec the sexuality that you celebrate just has to be within a marriage. And I know that's not what Beyonce is saying, but Beyonce is celebrating it within a marriage. Because in the black community, that's important. To have a, a successful woman who is married, who has a father who is involved in the upbringing of her daughter, and, and to, to fight against you know, negative and racist stereotypes of the black absent father. So I'm fighting a 
different fight. I'm fighting a fight in a culture that has so privileged marriage over everything in which I am not allowed to express sexuality outside of marriage. Beyonce's fight is to celebrate being a black married woman and fight a stereotype of black single mothers and absent black fathers. So I, I appreciate what she's doing. I just, I have another fight to fight. Um, about celebrity culture generally and feminism generally, I, you know, I just, this idea of, of we hate men, I mean, it's ridiculous. I go around telling men I, I love you guys too much, if anything. There's nothing about men I hate unless, you know, their sex is shit, then I hate them. But, you know, if they recognize what I'm doing and they're willing to be allies, I obviously don't hate them. If anything, I feel the hate from their side towards me. So I, I wish more, more and more young women would not think that they don't need feminism until a, po a kind of a painful, kind of hitting that glass ceiling moment where they recognize that we're not post-feminism. So I, I, to get the word out to as many people as possible, to show it and to link it to women who are tackling difficult issues in the way that Chimamanda is doing, and to subvert that stereotype and, and, to be, and to celebrate her body and to celebrate a marriage and to celebrate a very, very present black man in her life, I see why so many young black women look to Beyonce as a feminist. So I hope that does help spread it, you know. What, what I'm more upset about is all these young stars, you know, women stars will say, no, I'm not a feminist because I don't hate men. That's ridiculous, you know. That's not what feminism is about. Have I answered your question? Yeah, I just have an extension. Mm -hmm. so how, do, how would you react? For instance, there was this uh, Twitter friend of girls being like, I don't need feminism. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> yes. I, in a way, I'm feeling sorry for them. Yes. Because I'm feeling bad, and I don't yes. get how are we supposed to react? Are we supposed to be trying to protect them? Are we supposed Yes. Yes. Well, you know, something you said to me at the beginning was, was, is very pertinent to that. It's, these are women who don't recognize the multiple levels of privilege that allow them to say this, you know, that feminism helped you have this life that you now kind of look around and say, oh, I don't need feminism. But there will come a moment where you recognize why feminism is important to you. One of the most um, effective, I believe, ways that, that has been fighting this Tumblr thing is uh, other Tumblrs, like Cats for Feminism, that make fun of it. And there's also uh, an account on Twitter called, um, I can't remember now, I need to get my, my phone out and get it, but it's it's satire. But it's actually, it's you know when satire is so good, but what you're satirizing is, is, is so true that people think that what you're saying is real. It's like when there was a there was a this this satirical newspaper that said that uh, Michelle Bachman wanted to ban falafels because they were going to be a gateway sandwich to terrorism, and and it wasn't true. It wasn't true. It was a it was it was satire. But because Michelle Bachman could possibly say something like that, people believed it. And so there's this there's this account now on Twitter where this woman comes on every day and she willfully misspells feminism. So she'll go, I don't need fesimism because um, I believe men are strong and they will hold the door for me because I'm so weak. And people will look at that and they'll write to me and they go, Mona, how could you retweet such misogynist shit? And I'll go, come on, it's a parody. But because of these women holding up the signs, you know, saying I don't need feminism, it hits a bit close to home, you know? So, I mean, we satirize them, but honestly, you know, at the end of the day, when it comes to any kind of fight, I always tell people, focus on what you're doing rather than focusing on fighting against something negative someone is saying about you or about themselves. Focus on your feminism. Focus on the issues that are important to you because it, that's how you create the life you want for yourself. I hope those women don't reach a point where they realize why they need feminism because it will often mean something sad and dangerous is happening in their lives. But clearly, you know, it's, it's incredibly sad. So, unfortunately.